Wow, I, I think they have the wrong Andy Tennant, but. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, I have to give it to the Westport Public Library. Create, create an event to get him back in the door to pay his overdue late fees on the loan copy of Cinderella Man. <clears throat> And I also want to thank uh, Amazon and the National Football League, uh, who worked diligently this spring to schedule tonight's Giants kickoff at 8.15 to accommodate everybody at this event. So, um, I first met Jeremy Schapp nearly a quarter of a century ago. It was the year 2000, and the Mets and Yankees were facing off in the Subway Series. I was a young producer assigned to work with Jeremy on a feature telling the story of the New York City subway system. The seven, the four, the D trains, the underground arteries of New York City. It was perhaps my greatest achievement in 28 years at ESPN. Not the feature story or its primetime sports center airing. You see, I had done something no one had done previously. Shap was in the subway. The ride has been unforgettable. For nearly three decades at ESPN, Jeremy's journey has seen stops reporting at the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics, the FIFA World Cup, the Tour de France, the European Soccer Championship, the World Series, the Super Bowl, the US Open for both golf and tennis, Wimbledon, the French Open, the Men's Final Four, the Women's Final Four, the New York City Marathon, the NBA Playoffs, the Daytona 500, the Kentucky Derby, the Belmont Stakes, the list goes on and on. First class travel, of course. As host of ESPN's E60 and Outside the Lines, our signature storytelling and journalism brands, Jeremy has traveled the planet. Brazil, Serbia, Thailand, Israel, South Africa, to name a few, never seeing a coach seat, reporting on the most important, most impactful stories at the intersection of sports and society. He is a keen student of sports and its colorful figures and loves capturing the human drama innate to both. He masterfully uses sports and human athletic endeavor as a vehicle to examine the human condition, to help us reflect on who we are as people, our values as a society, and ultimately what we represent. Yes, he's told stories of curveballs, touchdowns, and slap shots, while also telling stories about running blocks of cheese down a British hillside. In reality, he has told important stories of systemic racism, deeply ingrained sexism and homophobia in American sport and in American society, about human rights abuses and the ways in which fortunes are built, about the destruction and carelessness with which the human body is treated in pursuit of fame and fortune. Jeremy uses sport as a backdrop against which he paints a picture of larger American society. And he does so with a sense of humanity, a sense of history, and a sense of humor. He is also decorated beyond Xenia. In 2015, he won the prestigious Robert F. Kennedy Award for journalism and reporting on human rights and social justice issues. He has won two national Edward R. Murrow Awards as well as a Peabody Award, two national headliner awards, and 13 national sports Emmy Awards. He told the story of the Great Depression through the tale of an underdog boxer in his book, Cinderella Man. And he told the story of America's struggling with its own imperfect progress toward equality through Jesse Owens' time at the Nazi Olympics in the New York Times bestseller, Triumph. It was Jeremy who interviewed Mike Tyson after the biggest bouts of his career. It was Jeremy who interviewed Manti Teo during the girlfriend scandal at Notre Dame. It was Jeremy who interviewed Daryl Strawberry after he was diagnosed with cancer. Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino as the US women's national team was seeking equal pay and Plaxico Burris after he shot himself at a New York City nightclub. Jeremy is probably best known for his memorable profile of Bobby Fischer, which he was honored with a National Sports Emmy Award for writing, an award name for his father, Dick Schapp. And Jeremy's also well known for his interview with Hall of Fame coach Bob Knight after Knight was fired by Indiana University back in 2000. 
Knight, frustrated at how Jeremy was putting on a master class in interviewing in front of a live national audience, said, you have a long way to go to be as good as your dad. In that moment, Jeremy, a proud son whose love for his dad was true and absolute gracefully, said, thank you, I appreciate that, and I take it as a compliment. Dick Schapp was the most talented person in our business, Dave Anderson once said. He could do anything in journalism, whether print or broadcasting. Whatever it took, he could do it, and do it as well, if not better, than anyone else. Like father, like son. There is no one we would rather have in the studio or in the field on a day of triumph or tragedy. Whether it was the Boston Marathon bombing or the death of Muhammad Ali or a world record set at the Olympics or Shohei Otani's next historic moment. These are great American stories, not just great sports stories. They're great American stories. And Jeremy Schapp is peerless in telling them. Here is a look at the ongoing, extraordinary, legendary career of my good friend, Jeremy Schapp. We're good? Where should we start? How many more years do you think you're gonna be in baseball? We're fortunate to call Jeremy a colleague every day. Michelle Kwan, Lennox Lewis, Caitlin Clark, Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, Alex Morgan, Megan Rapinoe, one of the major figures from MLS history and the owner of the new franchise in Miami, David Beckham. David, thank you so much for being with us. What does this fight mean to your legacy? How do you continue to dominate the tour in the fashion in which you dominated? How much longer do you want to do this? How would you describe your relationship with the Hall of Fame? How much responsibility do you and Lee take for the fact that the season right now is in jeopardy? What are you thinking at the moment you realize you have shot yourself? We get closer to the season. How do you think it's going to feel? Uh, relieved. You came here to do an interview. I'm asking you questions. Have I interrupted your questions yet? Yes. How does the recent court case speak to the state of the Knicks franchise? It demonstrates that they're not a model of uh, intelligent management. You're owning this book, aren't you? This is my book. Of course I'm owning it. It's my life story. I'm here to talk about it, and I'm giving you more than I've given any person. So work with me now. Okay. In many ways, you are the poster boy for a lot of the ills of baseball as people see them. I played the game by the rules. Jeremy joins us this morning from ESPN headquarters in Bristol. Jeremy? He convinced me that he was not party to this hoax. The big question, whether or not Jerry Sandusky himself will be called to the stand. Two explosions at the finish line of today's Boston Marathon. You think about how much our world has changed in the course of just a lifetime. In Sao Paulo, Jeremy Schapp, ESPN. But Donovan is gone! Oh, can you believe this? What does it say about the player you've become that you were able to pull this off? People that know me closest know how hard I've worked for this moment. The Denver Broncos select Tim Tebow. Tim, what did you do to convince the Broncos that you are worthy of this? Well, I just think I showed them uh, that I was willing to do whatever it took. Do you have freedom here to do what you want? You can be free here, never. Did you read the article where he said, there's not, I don't have the same bone in my body? Honestly, I, I don't know that you've done much here today, really to disprove anything he said. The incidence of illness has nothing to do with the effects of the gas leak. There is a problem due to the poverty. Not the gas leak. Not the poverty. What's your relationship with Brett now? I don't have one. No congratulations after the Super Bowl. I haven't talked to him. Should Barry Lamar Bonds be here in the Hall of Fame? Jealousy. Does that mean anything in your life? No, it really doesn't. When you think about the future, where do you find strength? In her. You are someone who has lived. Yeah. Are you 
you kidding me? It's such a rich life. You had to fight for your life everywhere you had been. I keep the sorrow to my inside. I believe and I, and I never retreat. Did Yudi's lesbianism, mm -hmm. is that what motivated the assailants to attack her, to kill her? I think they just wanted to inflict like the greatest pain ever on her because of her sexuality. How do you want to be remembered? Well, that's their problem. They're the one writing the obituary. I mean, what do I care? I'm dead. Catcher should love catching an ball. It's fun. Meet the world's fastest knife thrower, the great Prodini. Where do you go from here, Mike? I don't know, man. I might just fade into Bolivian. Look, I'm 70 years old this year. Not yet. <laughs> what does it mean to you, Mr. Scully? Vin. Vin. Nobody calls me Mr. If I can help it. What do you think is the secret to your success? I don't think there's a brain in there. So, uh, you know. Here. Huh? Oh! I don't get one. You don't get anything. I don't get it, right? Tom Brady, how does he react? What are we doing, Jules? You learn from your dad, Will, and you pass that on to your kid. Now let's keep that going. I gotta ask you the question that you just asked Mike Leach. How do you wanna be remembered? Oh boy, uh, that's too deep before we get to the bourbon, uh, Dave. Let's have a drink first. <laughs> Jeremy and I are bourbon buddies, so yeah, I thought it'd yeah, be appropriate lovely. if you. we had a drink just here tonight. A uh, I'm Dave Briggs, a member of the Westport Library Board of Trustees, very proud uh, of this library and grateful to Jeremy's role and, and being a part of the fabric of this library. We're very proud of special events like this. So thanks for being here. I'm a good friend of Jeremy's, a longtime broadcaster as well. When you watch that film, though, what's your reaction? What strikes you about watching your own career? Uh, I, what strikes me, honestly, Dave, and you know this feeling, is we have very good producers and very good editors uh, who, can, who can make you look very good. Uh, and I've been very fortunate. In, in all honesty, I mean, that's, you know, uh, I've been working at ESPN for 30 years. And, you know, you get a chance once in a while to look back and kind of reflect on, you know, what you've done, what's been special to you, what you think might matter. That's a nice little compendium of it. They did, you know, our colleagues did a very nice job putting it together. Um, but it makes me think about all the opportunities I've had, all the incredible opportunities to cover everything I've ever wanted to cover. All over the world, as Andy mentioned, and that was a very generous introduction, I'll be bringing it up at our next uh, performance review. Um, and, and, you know, just how fortunate I've been. And, and I've said this before, but to be in this business and getting into this business in the early 1990s, going to work at ESPN in 1993, so being there for the last 30 years, and, and you know, all these opportunities, it's not, it's not because of me. I mean, you know, I, I, I've done the work, but... You know, it's, it's um, being at a place that gives you a chance to go around the world, to tell these meaningful stories, especially in an era, and we know this, right? You know, I grew up in network news. My father worked in network news for 30 plus years, NBC and ABC News. And those are still great institutions, but they have retrenched in terms of their commitment to covering things around the world, in terms of the budgets, all that kind of stuff, whereas, at, you know, the same time at ESPN, it's just skyrocketed. And so through no um, particular insights of mine, uh, no gifts of prognostication or anything like that, I happened to land at the best place I could possibly land to build a career over these last several decades. And we're very fortunate you wound up here in Westport, which has become the unofficial home yes. of ESPN. For those of you who don't know, Jeremy lives here. Jimmy Bataro, the president of ESPN. Mike Greenberg, Jay Williams, Dan Orlovsky, Ryan Smith, Chris McKendry. There are quite a few. Did you get a finder's fee on, on all those? Did you start the Westport ESPN? No, you know, I, I did go to high school here, so I, I think I have... Um, you know, more Westport cred, perhaps, and, and I lean in on that a lot, but uh, they, many of them have lived here 
longer. So I, I did, I graduated from Staples High School in 1987, uh, but I only lived here for two years, uh, from 85 to 87. And then when I went off to college, my mom, my parents were divorced, my mom moved back to the city. So it was those two years, but I always liked Westport. So when my wife, Jocelyn, and I, when we were building a family, this was the place we wanted to come to. And But yeah, there, there's... There's a lot of sports media people here. And, and happy anniversary to you and Thank Jocelyn. You. 15 years. Yes. Thank you. Last night, yeah. Yeah, she's a very patient woman. All of you know Jeremy is probably the, the greatest sports journalist of our time, but also the son of the greatest sports journalist in the country as well, which is truly extraordinary. And your experience has started early. Your career was built probably... As a child, tagging along with your dad, totally. is there a story that kind of crystallizes those experiences growing up? Yeah, you know, it, it is. I mean, you saw a little clip of it there. That was an interview. I, I mean, an interview. It's silly to call it an interview. It was an interaction with Pete Rose in the spring of 1978. Um, but, you know, he, he let me tag along. And, you know, as a parent, you know, if you have that opportunity to let your kids see what you do and to be around you, and if it's something that's fun, like, you know, being a sports reporter and being on TV, they might, there's a reason why there are so many second and third generation people in this business, because it's not work. It's, it's, um, it's something different than that. And I got to go to everything with them and, you know, meet all the great athletes of that era. Um, you know, I spent my time up on the seventh floor of 30 Rock pretty much every weekend, you know, annoying, you know, his office mate, Marv Albert, and uh, guys like Jack Cafferty, and Chuck, Chuck Scarborough, and John Chancellor, and Tom Bro, the people who were around the building, Jessica Savage, everybody was around the building at that time. And, and again, it was a golden age, right? right. You know, this network television. I mean, it, it you know, it was glamorous. And so, and then being around the sports, which was my obsession, you know, I got to see it up close. It, it, you know, why would you want to uh, do anything else? You know about Dick, you know about Jeremy. You may not know about Winston, though, who might be the biggest TV star in this family. Yeah, my son. And I hope Winston is going to ask a question tonight, and we hope all of you will as well. Where, Where are, are you, Winnie? It's going to be a conversation, so please. Where is he? Whenever yeah. you have a question, yeah, he, the microphone is right got, over he's here. He's got all the talent. Oh, he's up there in the top he, row. He is gifted. He's ready. So the mic is to my right, your left, in front of the white screen here. Please ask a question as they come up. We'd rather not wait till the end, so please step on up and ask a question. And Winston, we hope you do step up. One of those stories uh, that you experienced with your father was a film we debuted here at the library, which was The Imposter. Oh, yeah, yeah. The and we have awesome. a clip from that. Oh, For those of you that haven't seen it, it is terrific. We highly recommend you see it. Here's a portion. My father was a famous sports reporter. His name was Dean Shaq. And he knew everybody, all the great athletes of the mid to late 20th century. He knew actors and writers, politicians. Our home was a kind of celebrity salon. The only requirement for entry was that you must be interesting. But of all my father's friends, perhaps none was more interesting than this man. A kind of pseudo-celebrity. His name? Barry Bremen. Over the years, Bremen and Schaap, Barry and Dick, they would blur the lines between subject and reporter, friend and accomplice, all in the pursuit of fun. So fascinating. Your careers both intersect with that one story. What drew your father to the imposter who snuck in sporting well, events well, on the field in uniform in yeah, photos it's one of my favorite stories dave it, it's it's a great story um that we told on e60 last year and in fact barry's daughter erin is back there i see her there most of you everybody in westport and fairfield knows erin and her lovely husband doug um uh so it's a great story it, it, you know what the story ends up being is about barry's uh, shenanigans, but it's bigger than that. And that's the kind of stories we, we like, and I'm not giving anything away at this point, but the story is about how Barry, uh, for many, many years, was also um, a very avid, I guess that's the best way to put it, avid sperm donor. And um, 
it was, <laughs> and, uh, and his donations were um, much prized. And uh, it turns out now we found out in the last few years that, uh, that Barry is the biological father uh, of at least, what's the number up to Aaron? Is it 45, 46? 46 kids. So, it, so it's a story about identity. It's a story about family. It's a story about nature versus nurture. It's a story about chutzpah, um, which Barry had in spades. Um, that's what it's about, and that's why it's one of my favorite stories. You didn't just experience the stories. You woke up at night at times, and there were celebrity athletes in your home. Tell the folks a story or two about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, it was a different world, right? It, it was... It was a world in which uh, reporters and the subjects they covered, there was not uh, as much of a barrier between them. And my father, in particular, was someone who had these close relationships with the greatest athletes of the time. Namath, Ali, Seaver. I mean, you know, on, they, they were friends. They were collaborators, in many cases, on books together. Uh, and... and you know, it's become much more adversarial, uh, those relationships. But in my father's era, it was different. And he certainly um, you know, was able to approach the job. And he was tough-minded. And, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that he wasn't. But it, it was, it was um, more celebratory than it is now in many ways. And, and, and he was right there at the right moment when sports and celebrity intersected in such a way, and he was the guy, if you were a big star, who was going to write your book? It was going to be Dick Schapp. Who was the guy who was going to show you around New York when you came through the city for the first time, like Muhammad Ali when he was 18? It was going to be Dick Schapp. And so uh, those were his friends, as well as the people who were in his circle that he covered. So, you know, I, I met and spent time around all of them. And I, and I think, you know, beyond the idea of... <laughs> you know, it, it, it making it seem so cool what my dad did, it, it develops a certain, um, I think it develops a certain perspective on things, right? Like, like yeah. you're not necessarily awed by those kinds of figures. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. What, what would Dick be most proud that you accomplished? I mean, to me, you, you shine a light on stories. And Andy did a terrific job recounting the awards and the, the things you've covered. But you shine a light on stories that might otherwise remain in the dark. I fear what happens in the next generation. But what would your father be most proud of? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think he would be, you know, we got to work together for several years. He died in 2001. I'd been at ESPN at that point for, you know, seven or eight years, something like that, and we got to work together a lot. We hosted a radio show together. We worked on uh, different projects together. We covered some of the same stories, the same events, the Olympic Games. I think, uh, I think he'd be proud uh, of the way that I like to think I approach my job, which uh, is seriously, uh, with respect for the subjects, with respect for the audience, as well, those are things you always have to balance, um, and and that we've, I think, at East 60 and outside the lines over the last 30 years, I think we've expanded the parameters of what constitutes a sports story. Um, that it's beyond, you know, the playing fields, uh, as as the name of the show suggests. That that sports really is a place where so much in society, um, uh, we can see clearly, you know, the way it plays out in sports, the way it intersects with everything else. And that's really what we've covered is that, that intersection of sports and society at large, sports and social justice issues, sports and human rights issues, sports and public health issues, all of these things. And that, um, you know, I, I, I don't take it for granted having the platform or the opportunities to tell these stories. I think that's the most important thing. I think you'd be proud of the father you are, too. And with that, we turn oh, it over to Winston. Already? Come on. For our first question of the night. Yes, sir. I don't know. <laughs> it's working. It's working. I see how loud it is. So I've noticed from home in front of large audiences, the 
two or three times that I went to work with you that, in my opinion, what you do is spectacular. Oh, that's very kind, buddy. So that's very nice, buddy. I've been thinking of a question all since my friends reminded me today at school that you were doing this tonight. Okay, what's the question? So Let's get to it. Come on. <laughs> what can I do to be like you? Oh, that's very sweet, buddy. You're well doing done. fine. Well You're done. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. You're doing a great job, really. And I'm very proud of you. Just keep watching. Thank That's you. <laughs> Go to work. We, now we can, you know, take the kids back to work, which is nice. It was, you know, it was hard during the pandemic, obviously. You, know, you couldn't take kids to work and all that. So I'm, I'm glad we had that opportunity again. Well, I, Thank you, bud. Uh, continue to ask questions. We will take them all night. One thing you can do, Winston, and anyone can do, is watch the entire Bob Knight interview oh, from 23 God. years ago, which I did earlier today. You did? I've the never entire, seen it. I was going to ask you that. You've never seen it. Not in its entirety, no. It is a master class, as Andy said, in journalism. It is truly remarkable and I think really sets you apart from all of your peers. Well, thank you. Let's watch a clip oh, and then we'll discuss okay. it. But again, before you interrupted, what I, what, and you have a real fact that you're doing this. Uh, thank you. No, I don't think it's anything to really be too proud of yourself. Uh, I think when I talked about Pat, Bobby came here to the interview. When I talk, to, will they let me finish the answer? Is that okay? Is that fair enough? Have I interrupted your questions yet? No, I haven't. You've interrupted my answers with your questions, and then I've tried to get back. So let me finish. <laughs> got a long way to go to you better keep that in mind. That was a fun night. <laughs> That was, that was must have been the longest four or five seconds of your life you know waiting to hear what was coming out of his mouth. By that point, I'll tell you, you know, you've, you've been in this experience, Dave. You've done more live TV than I have. You know, it's all about, like, getting comfortable and being in the moment and all that. And, and at the beginning of the interview, you know, I was nervous. I mean, this was by far the biggest thing I'd ever done in my career. Um, I knew everybody was watching. I mean, it's a very rare moment. Um, to have something like that. Like, they're big interviews all the time, right? But, but they, don't, they don't come along. They, they do come around, uh, but they don't come around that frequently in sports where it's the biggest story. And that was the biggest story in the country when Bob Knight got fired in the fall of 2000. Not sports story. The biggest right. story. Period. And everybody wanted him. And, and usually in these situations, and I've done a number of big news-making interviews, you know, it's, a diff it's an entirely different dynamic because... You're sitting in a hotel room or a conference room or somebody's house or something like that, and it's on tape. I mean, I don't know how many of those kinds of interviews have ever been done live like that, where it's an hour show that's set aside for an interview, and he insisted on doing it live. I certainly didn't want to do it live um, because he knew he could, you know, use up all the time the way that he wanted to. He thought he could bully you. He thought he could bully me. He could filibuster me. I don't think he thought he would have to bully me. I think he thought I would just ask him easy questions. And, um, you know, so, you know, you know going in, everybody's watching, you know all your bosses and colleagues are watching, everybody's judging it. There'd been an interview on ESPN a few months earlier, which um, uh, had turned out different. Um, and, and he had since been subsequently been fired. Um, and so there was, a lot of, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot at stake. And I was just, when it was over, I was just like, leave. Yeah, it was good. I, we're going to have to watch that over a bourbon. Oh, watch the whole, Never watch the whole you thing. You were 31 interviewing 31. the most intimidating man in sports. I've needed a, several outfit changes before that. It, it, you it, know, it, it was, it was, it was so, the whole thing. I mean, I could talk about it for a long time. It's been a long, it's been many years, but, you know, he wanted to get together all day. He kept calling, let's go have a cup yeah. of coffee. And I, I avoided him all day. I didn't want to be near him. I didn't want to give him a chance to kind of, soften me up you know I didn't want to give him a chance to establish a dialogue before the interview that the viewers would not be privy to because that would upset kind of what people were seeing you know he'd be referencing back you remember when I told you that you remember that? I didn't want any of that and I just didn't want I just didn't want Bob in my face before we did that but it was it was and I had interviewed him previously and he'd been much ruder than he was there. Um, in fact, 
In fact, uh, I had interviewed him when I was working in local television in New York, and you know, I thought I was being tough. I was asking questions about the, the narrative at the time was that Bob Knight was softening, he was becoming more mellow, which was all bullshit. And, um, it, but I, you know, it, it was kind of the narrative at the time, and I was asking about that, and he was getting annoyed. He was getting more annoyed and more annoyed. I remember where we were. We were up at one of the mezzanines in the Marriott Marquis in Times Square. And then he said, you know what? And I, I'm sorry, I apologize to the kids out there. Um, he said, you know what? <laughs> you were doing very well up until now, but now you're in over your head. This is bullshit. This is all blanking bullshit. <laughs> and then he just took off, started taking off his microphone. And Russell Sherman remembers, he was there at New York One at the time working with me. That was a great interview. I can't even find the tape, Russell. I wish I could. That was great. That was great. I stole it out of the archives when I left New York One and lost it. Uh, I was ready. I'd been yeah. there before. And Willie Weinbaum, who's here, one of our greatest producers at ESPN History, he told me it was his, that was the night of his 40th birthday. And I was very upset I couldn't be at his 40th birthday, but I had to go do the interview with Bob Knight. And he told me, you know, he's going to invoke your dad at some point. You should keep that in mind. You knew it. Yeah. I, you know, Willie yeah. said it, but I was probably too stupid to really absorb it, you know. You have very few peers in, in this business. John Wertheim is one. He's a good friend of ours. Right. And he, he wanted to know, what did you n refrain from saying to Bob or wish you would have said? Nothing. Really? Nothing. No, you know, and that's something people talked about at the time. I remember. When he insulted you, you're glad you thanked him. I'm glad I did exactly. Okay. I, think, I think in retrospect, it was exactly the right thing to say. And I remember that week, you know, I got a lot of phone calls from people. I got a lot of great notes and messages. And I remember, you know, probably, you know, one of the greatest of all time in our business, Bob Costas called me. He was in Australia for the Olympics. It was taking place during the Sydney Olympics. And he said, I wish you'd said to him, well, you've got a long way to go to be as good as Dean Smith. <laughs> and, and Bob's brilliant. And, and, and I wish I had that kind of self-possession and I wish I had that kind of quick mind like Bob to have thought of that in the moment, but it would have been the wrong thing to say. It would have been the right thing for Bob to say because Bob was 46, 47 he might have. years old. You were 31, yeah. And it would have seemed, I think, even in that moment, even as he was insulting me, it would have been impertinent, it would have been braddish, and it was irrelevant. Um, so I think that was the right thing to do. I think you've, yes. Thank you. I agree. I think that's the common thread throughout your career. You always know the exact thing to say. And oh, in fact, I wish. I think the greatest line you've ever dropped on TV is without question, and I know Andy Tennant would agree. And it's the other story that you're long associated with. And you've covered World Series, Super Bowls, World Cups, Olympics. Oddly, it's chess. Right. Chess that Love might chess. be the thing that people associate you most with if it's not Bob Knight. Let's watch some of this back and forth with Bobby Fischer. Back to this, this guy. Uh, what's your, what's Jeremy. your first name? Jeremy Shack. Uh, I hate to, you know, rap people personally, but his father, many, many years ago, befriended him, took me out to the, I don't remember. Nick's game. Nick's game. You were 12. Acted kind of like a father figure. And then later, like a typical Jewish snake, he had the most vicious things to say about me. I have to object. OK. Yeah, you, did you read what he said about me in that article? I heard things that he said about me. Did you read the article where he said, that, no, I don't have a stain bone in my body? Honestly, I'm, I'm not sure if I read it, but I know that he said it. Yeah. And, and honestly, I, I don't know that you've done much here today, really to disprove anything he said. <laughs> One of the great walk-off home runs uh, ever hit. That was a gem. Why did you walk off after making that There was that nothing comeback? left to say to Bobby Fisher after that. And, um... That, that was, that was a, uh, an interesting one. You know, that was 18 years ago, Dave. And, um... Again, you know in the moment, right, when these things are happening, whether it's Bob Knight or Bobby Fischer or something like that, like, these don't come around every day, these kinds of moments. Bobby Knight, I knew, you know, it was being covered like a heavyweight fight. You know, the state police were there, and there were um, velvet ropes and stuff. This, I had no idea. I didn't know the press conference was taking place until 10 minutes before it took place in Iceland. 
And uh, it was not what I expected. I expected to ask him questions that everybody had wanted to ask him questions. The same kind of questions people had wanted to ask him at that point for 30 plus years. And he was famously elusive and reclusive. And um, yeah, he just, you know, he just went too far. And uh, at some point you just have to, uh, you know, you have to uh, respond. Why was that a story that resonated with the public? Most people don't play chess and never well, have Well, you know, will. that's interesting too, right? So, you know, I grew up in the business, um, you know, the, the, the like central tenet is the story is not about you, right? It's not about yourself. Don't make it about yourself. Keep, you know, which is, you know, why I didn't, you know, with Bob Knight want to make it about myself when he was making it personal. And that's what I grew up understanding to be the fundamental rule of journalism and reporting. And yet, when you have moments that are personal, that do touch on the personal, both of these are about my father to some extent, to a large extent, that's what people remember. That's what resonates. A and it's, it's kind of an interesting um, paradox. And the Bobby Fischer story, I think, Look, it's one of the great stories. That's why there are movies about Bobby Fischer and all that. The greatest chess player ever, probably, at least before Kaspar. Anyway, you know, great. You know, the 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 greatest figure in the the game that has been uh, emblematic of intelligence for thousands of years, right? And he's the greatest mind ever. And he didn't he didn't fulfill his potential. He wins the world championship. He walks away. Why? He becomes rabidly anti-Semitic, uh, anti-American. You know, my dad used to say, or I think, I'm sorry, it was somebody else who said, it was a grandmaster, I can't remember his name, who said of Bobby Fischer, uh, he's a Jewish American chess champion who hates Jews, hates America, and hates chess. So <laughs> there's some issues. And, um, and, and, and the interesting thing, too, the specific thing he's talking about, my father, who had been very close to him, when he said he didn't have a sane bone in his body, my father really did, and he did write that, or it was a story quoting, I think it was a story he wrote in Games Magazine, uh, of which it was like one of the 20 magazines he was editing when I was a kid. Um, he was saying it to defend Bobby Fischer. He was saying he can't be held responsible for his actions because he's insane. He was not ripping him. There were enough people ripping him. He was saying, you know, you have to treat him in a different way because he's damaged and he's fragile. And of course, Bobby Fischer didn't think of himself that way. Um, and that's where that conflict arises. But, but it, was, um, it was one of those moments where like, yeah, this is different. And you may never get to report another story like that in your life. You'll never get to stick the landing quite like you did there. We have a question over here in the corner, sir. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to see you again, Jeremy. And, and on behalf of the wise men, I want to thank you for the fantastic job you did a couple of weeks ago uh, with Gino Oriema. Oh, uh, Gino's the best. You just had, roll out the ball. I didn't do anything. It was, it was an incredible, it was an incredible morning. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question which may or may not be comfortable, but oh, I boy. figured I'll set you up okay. with that. Um, what is your real feeling today about the integration or invasion of gambling in sports? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, and you're talking about legalized gambling in the U.S., the Supreme Court decision, which I think was in 2018, which paved the way for states beyond Nevada to, to have legal wagering on sports. And... For instance, I mentioned Willie Weinbaum. He's here. Willie and I have talked about this issue many times over the decades. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's one of those things, and we've done countless stories, shows on outside the lines about sports wagering. Look, there's no doubt. I interviewed Billy Walters on TV a couple weeks ago. Billy Walters is the most famous sports gambler ever. Um, you probably heard about the book because he said that Phil Mickelson had wagered a billion dollars in the last 27 years, and he had the receipts, uh, and they had a wagering partnership for many years, basically because Billy was so well-known and so successful that he, he couldn't gamble under his own name, so he has to use other people to... Anyway, my point is, you know, I asked Billy that same question, and he said, look, you know, um, you know, 
legal wagering. It's something that exists on sports, I think, everywhere in the world, basically, except the United States. And now it's also in the United States. Are there problems? Are there people who are going to be compulsive and addicted? Is it going to ruin lives? Yes, that's all problematic. That's something we have to be concerned about. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there's so much, and, and, and this, this is a real but, there is so much illegal wagering anyway, right? Billions and billions of dollars every year, uh, as well as legal wagering in Nevada and, you know, at the horse, uh, you know, at the tracks and all that stuff. I, I, I'm troubled because I know there are consequences, right? But this is the world in which we live. This is what the Supreme Court said every state can do. Um, and, and the idea that, you know, the U.S. should be different. Like, I, you know, I used to, you know, I've covered a million sports events in the U.K., right? Every 15 yards, there's a gambling parlor. You know, there's a Ladbrokes or, um, you know, I forget the names of the other ones. They're all, you know, famous concerns. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't feel like the culture is that much different in terms of how much more gambling or... Uh, how much more addiction there is. I, I, I think it's tough for the kid. I think it's tough. Young people are very susceptible, and especially young men um, are very susceptible to getting in over their heads. So I think it's problematic, and it's something that we have to keep an eye on. But it's here, and it's legal. And if you're talking about the corruption of our games, that's an issue as well, but it always has been. And there are people who would argue, and I'm not smart enough on the subject to tell you whether they're right, that having it out uh, in the open air, in the sun, above board, uh, will root out you know, cheating and point shaving more than the system that we had previously. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they say. Well, I guess it's, it's basically coming out as a reality as opposed to a secret, a poorly kept secret, but I really appreciate your forthright. Yeah, uh, yeah no, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Thank you for the question. You mentioned young men as a father of a 15-year-old. I, I could see an E60 on high school boys proliferation for gambling right now. It might blow your mind. Right. I mean, you know, and, and they, again, they all have and FanDuel, and DraftKings, and bet on an almost daily they're, basis. They're not supposed to, right? Like, how we do we allow it? That's how it happens. You're looking at one right here who allows it. Right. Every weekend. So, like through your account, you mean, no. or, or something. We have to approve okay. each bet, yes. I see. Okay, but it's yeah. going I mean, on look, across you know, the board. You know, I, I have some friends here. I went to college with. You know, we we had a colleague at our school paper who I think was the dorm bookie. Um, you know, <laughs> there were. I remember guys in college, and it was it was illegal. They found a way, but it's certainly much more accessible, much easier now. And I recommend some of these college buddies get your butts over there to oh the microphone and ask some questions. Did you guys me. know where this gonna be. story started? Um, not just gambling, but social media. And Chris McKendry, your colleague, our uh, Westport neighbor here, wanted to know how you feel about the proliferation of social media and its impact on sports journalism today. Does it ultimately kill sports journalism as we know it? I think it's, I think everything's different. I think it's beyond social media, right? It's, it's, I came into the business you know, I'm not that old, I'm 54, you know, no one had a cell phone, there was no such thing as the internet, no one had email, you couldn't text, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't communicate instantly with your colleagues, much less the world. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a problem in a lot of ways, and I've talked about this, you know, at journalism schools and stuff, I think it's a problem because you don't have an editor. I think that's a problem. You know, people put stuff out there without any vetting whatsoever and you know I'm very traditionalist in this respect and there were there were great things about having gatekeepers there were bad things and there were great things about having gatekeepers editors are great colleagues reviewing what you're going to put out to the world that's a great thing and that doesn't that's not what happens on social media with reporters anymore and you know they've look it's 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 a risk reward right if you make the decision that that's how you're going to do your job and sometimes it's not a choice. Sometimes it, it's simply a necessity. If you're, a, you know, if you're a beat guy, obviously, if you're a news and information person like Adam Schefter, Adrian Wojnarowski, and you've got nine million followers and twelve million followers, you know, you have to have that kind of presence. I feel I'm very lucky that I work in a different part of the industry 
where it's not about instantaneous news. It's not about this signing and that injury. And I don't mean to diminish it at all. That's that stuff is absolutely essential. That is news. You know, that is news. It's important to people. It matters. It's about lives and careers. It's just not what I do. And I couldn't imagine those pressures that they're under. It was like you know, when I was uh, when I was in college and I was a newspaper, you know, copy boy in the summers and you know, I could see, oh, here are the columnists and they get to think about it and they get to take their time and they get to, you know, write about their opinions. And then there are the beat guys, you know, who are traveling with the Mets and the Yankees, you know, seven months a year. I'm like, boy, that's, that's, that's gotta be something you're, you know, that's in your blood, that's in your essence that you want to do. And, and, and um, for me, that kind of minute-to-minute -minute reporting just isn't it. We're not done with your social media. Stick around. Oh, boy. Because for those of you who don't follow Jeremy on social media, it's, oh. it's just an incredible experience. I know experience. where we're going. Yes, sir. Jeremy, thank you. Yes, for, sir. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, you didn't mean to go to the Santana cover concert. You, nah. you didn't end up here by accident, did you? You're much more fun. <laughs> I might be old enough for Santana, right. but you're more fun. Okay. So I'd like to tap your perspective, if you would. There's a guy out there who's playing baseball now, Shohei Otani. Yep. Is he the best baseball player that we're ever going to see? I think there's a very strong argument to be made, yes. And it's almost difficult for me to conceive of an argument in which the answer would be no. I mean, what he's doing is unprecedented. It's, you know, and, and I'm, I, I you know, I, I get made fun of at ESPN and elsewhere for this. You know, I, I really lean into the history, and I, I'm certainly much more familiar with the lineup of, you know, the 1936 Yankees than the 2023 Yankees. Um, so I feel like I have some breadth of perspective here, but what Otani is doing is unprecedented. There have only been a handful in the history of the game going back 160, 170 years, players who are great on the mound and at the plate. A handful. And he is doing it in an era in which nobody else is doing it. Uh, he's, he's an incredible power hitter, an incredible slugger. He's, he's, he was the best hitter in baseball up until the point at which he got hurt. He is among the top five or six starting pitchers in the game when he's healthy. Um, you know, what Babe Ruth did, you know, you know so, so Ruth was a great pitcher from 1914 through 1918. 1919, he switched the outfield. He set the record with 29 home runs. And then, of course, he was too valuable a hitter to have him pitch anymore. You know, he's, he's, but he's doing it simultaneously at the top of his game where Ruth transitioned in 1918, 1919. And when you're just talking about, like, one guy, Babe Ruth to compare him to, and maybe Martin DeHigo, who was an incredible player himself, a Hall of Famer, the great Cuban player, who was a great all-star um, as a pitcher and a hitter. And there are only a couple of guys. I think uh, Willie and I, talk, I think John Montgomery Ward might be in that conversation, but that was baseball in the 1880s. Yes, best we've seen. Thank you. Sure. Jeremy, we have a, a question from the next generation. Oh, okay. Annabelle, this is my daughter, my younger daughter. Okay. Okay, Annabelle. They're, they're all, uh, yeah. What's your question, Annabelle? Um, what was your favorite store you've done? Sports event. Oh, that's a good question. That's a well, great question. Great question. Well, it depends. Nice what job. You, thank you, Annabelle. Knuckles. Thank you, Maya. It's a great job. Um, so, you know, I, I've had uh, so many great experiences, so many events that I've loved. It depends what you mean. If you're talking about, like, a single game moment that just kind of like you know is is overwhelming because you know the significance and the, I, I put the 1998 world cup final in paris at the top of the list why so you know it, it's different when you're a kid i mean if we're talking about things i saw when i was a kid you know like you know the mookie wilson game and the bucky dent game and all that that's different you know you're a kid it's it's a different it's a different level but as a reporter in 1998, I covered um, the World Cup, and France won. It was the first time France had ever won the World Cup. They won it on their own soil. They won it the Stade de France in Paris. It was a team that was emblematic of a new, more diverse France. The party that night in Paris, you know, I, I, 
there's nothing like it in the U.S., right, um, that quite approaches what you see in other countries during the World Cup. As much as we celebrate, uh, and we've celebrated the great victories by the U.S. women's national team, as much as we celebrated, you know, 1980 when the men won um, the hockey gold medal in Lake Placid, all of that, I've been in Brazil during the World Cup. I've been in France during the World Cup. I've been in South Africa. It's, it's a different, again, it's a different order of magnitude. Every, everybody, everything else shuts down. Nothing else matters. And that moment, um, just never see anything like it. I mean, you know, we, we have our teams. We have our pro teams. We have our college teams. We're passionate about them. We care about them. But, you know, that kind of commitment and support for a national team from everyone in society uh, is just is is different with the the World Cup and in France in '98 it was like that. I once heard you say the Stanford Cal band game was the greatest sports story of all time. Greatest play. Greatest play. Greatest play. What's the sports story that would have been amplified a hundred x if it happened today? If it happened in the era of social media? Oh, okay. So, or, or what's that story that you'd love to tell your kids who have spoken eloquently here tonight? Yeah. Um, You'd like them to know about that they that, that I've been to. Okay, um, well, and, and I was going to say, you know, so th that moment really, you know, stands out. I remember the party in Paris that night. It, it, I went to bed at like five in the morning. Nobody else had gone to sleep in Paris that night. It was insane. Um, and but the Tour de France is the best if you like eating, which I do, because I got to do the Tour de France a lot, and the Tour de France is just amazing, because like every day it's- Because the food. Lunch is great, breakfast is great, dinner is great. <laughs> it's just unbelievable, and you see all these towns you don't get to see, but, but it, I, I really think the Stanford Cal play, and we did a, a show about it last year, so if those of you who don't remember, it's now been 41 years since the play, one of the great rivalries in college sports, Stanford Cal, you know, won on the most unlikely play in the history of football. You know, they've been playing football since 1869. Um, that, could you imagine what that would be like? So it, that play, and Pick if you don't up, know it, it's, eat that up. it's five laterals, and they win at the last second, all that stuff. It wasn't even on live TV. Nobody saw the video for hours. I mean, think about that. It's not that long ago again. This is the greatest play ever. These are major programs. It wasn't on TV anywhere. That, that's the kind of thing people would still be... Yeah, you know, it would break the internet. It would be incredible. I think we have a, another question. Yes, sir. I want to riffle back to your um, interview with Gino Oriyama because oh, it was okay. it was it sure. was a master class. I was Thanks. there. Um, when you interview a guy like that, you obviously do a lot of background. Uh, you you knew what you were going to ask him, and you knew what he was going to say, and. And well, yet, I wouldn't say I knew what he was going to say. But but in the audience, it came off as being completely impromptu. How do you do that? Uh, that's very kind. Thank you. Um, look, you know, preparation is important. Whatever you're doing, I I'll be honest. With Gino, you don't really have to prepare much. <laughs> I mean, he's like, he. I I've done a, a million of these things, you know, events with figures in sports, you know, very from the very famous to, you know, almost completely unknown. In terms of owning a room, knowing that he's going to be entertaining, that he's going to be candid, there are very few people who compare with Gino Oriyama. I've interviewed him many times over the years, that kind of comfort level. So we, you know, that's very nice of you to say we had a good time here a couple of weeks ago. He is, you know, it, it helps too, right? When you happen to be the most successful coach in the history of women's basketball, and you've won 11 national championships, and you've got all that instant credibility, and you don't have to establish any of the bona fides, right? And, he, and he's in a position, because he's so established, which is obviously a ridiculous understatement, that he's comfortable saying, he can say whatever he wants to say. What does it matter anymore? You know what I mean? Which doesn't mean he says, you know, wild, outlandish, or inappropriate things, but he's at a point where, you know, you see it with a lot of people, in this day and age, obviously, where you can't be that comfortable, and I think Gino is. Did he ever wonder if he could win in men's basketball? I know that is a bit of a sexist question. You I know, I, I didn't ask him, and I'm sure that Gino feels he could have won doing anything. <laughs> I'm sure. Yes, sir. Hey, Jeremy, how are you doing? Oh, hi, Matt. How are hey. you? Closer. Can you hear me now? I hear you. I don't think I'm a 
Bremen at all. I Aaron, I'm sorry. I think your dad did not father me. What? I, I think, sorry, Aaron for a minute thought Get maybe here. I what, was what a, a Barry Bremen's. I was not a offspring of Barry okay. Bremen. More curious as about your, your, your take on, I know you're a big Deion Sanders fan. More take on um, the NIL. Is, is, is college sports professional sports? So... You saw that I, I think one yes, of Sanders' kids yes, is now making now. It's million totally dollars. different, right? So, is the NCAA legitimate, or is it more? It's now just a professional sport at a college level. Look, I mean, I don't know how you want to characterize it, but you know what we've seen in the last few years, obviously in college sports, and we talked about this with Gino a couple of weeks ago. And he, I mean, he couldn't be clearer, right? He's in the middle of it. You know, Paige Beckers, I think he said, is making more money now than he made in his first 25 years at UConn. Which is great. He's not uh, more money than he'll make it. at the next level as well. Right. Which is a That's right. Run. Which is which is also interesting. Look, everything is different. It's very interesting now. There's NIL. There's the transfer portal. So you know, it's free agency for the athletes out there to an extent. But what we still don't have is direct payment to the athletes. You know, the money it's being outsourced right to the sponsors and to the NIL collectives and so forth. And look. That's going to get very messy. It's already gotten messy, right? You know, collectives making promises they couldn't keep. You know, writing checks they didn't have the funds, you know, to, to back up. Um, it's, it's an entirely different world. Um, you know, more than ever before, college sports, uh, you know, seems separated from the educational missions of these institutions because it's it's just different but we just don't know what the consequences are going to be we can't see the future i mean the one thing i've learned in this business and i'm sure all of you have learned in your businesses is that nobody knows anything right <laughs> like nobody can see the future uh we have all kinds of theories about the way it's going to play out and what's going to happen who knows but isn't what's happening in boulder colorado my alma mater Proof that it hasn't ruined anything. You've got Deion Sanders coming in. Yeah, I don't think His it's going to ruin anything. going to make millions of dollars. It's just changing the model. Your network has seen record ratings. Unbelievable. Weeks. Right, right. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting, and I, look, I've been in on this story for a long time. Ed O'Bannon started this, right? The UCLA star who brought the lawsuit because he, he saw his own image in one of those video games and he said, why am I not getting paid, right? That is what started this conversation. That moment when Ed O'Bannon decided to sue. And I've been covering Ed since he followed, I wrote the forward to his book. Uh, we've been following this, you know, step by step by step for a very long time. Uh, yeah, my only point is that, this, this is the way I would characterize it. What's happening now is more fair than it used to be. The athletes deserve to be able to monetize this. Um, they deserve to be able to transfer without all the encumbrances that were in place before. But if we're talking about what the consequences are going to be for the full landscape of college sports, we just don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, Jeremy, uh, great job tonight. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you as well. It's great to see your kids and how big they've, they've gotten. <laughs> They're hams. Um, I was going to ask a question about the, the Bobby Knight you know, interview. And sure. I just saw that 30 for 30 doc again. And I kudos to you for talking about it earlier. It was super Thanks. interesting to me. You know, my question is kind of random, but I, I'm a big basketball fan, and it's interesting to get your perspective on just athletes from yesteryear. So my question is, Will Chamberlain, do you think he was properly rated, underrated? And then also with your father, you know, living in New York for so many years, did he ever have any, I don't know, interactions, or was he somebody your father ever got to know, in addition with Lou Alcindor, you know, growing up in the city, playing basketball in the city? Just any fun stories you could share about either of them would be interesting. Well, that's, you know, it's great. So um, I got a few fun stories. So Wilt was somebody very, he was one of those guys I should have mentioned earlier, very close to my dad. My dad loved Wilt. Um, he loved his sense of humor, his playfulness. Uh, he was firmly in the Wilt camp. And my father lived long enough to see Michael Jordan's entire career. And he believed, and I have uh, inherited his belief, that Wilt Chamberlain was the greatest basketball player ever. Um, he was certainly the most dominant. I mean, that's not arguable. Uh, you know, the question is, you know, whether, you know, playing in the late 50s through the 60s and early 70s is a fair comparison to, you know, we see better athletes now than we did, obviously, then. I'm, I'm still 
If you told me I had one guy to pick, it would probably be Wilt. He was very close. So in fact, Wilt comes back around to Bobby Fischer for him. Wilt, as you probably know, played chess. He was a big chess guy. And my dad liked to tell a story. Um, he, he, he's staying at Wilt's famous house out there in L.A. where it was kind of a marvel of its time with, like, a pool that, like, was winding through the kitchen and the living room and all that stuff in a bedroom that was just a waterbed, and we don't have to get into the details and um, all that stuff. And so, uh, you know, they were talking about chess or playing chess, my dad and Wilt, and Wilt said, you know, I'd really like to meet Bobby Fischer. And Bobby was living in Pasadena, and so my dad said, well, I'll call him. Let's see if he'll, you know, come over. And this is like 73 or 74 when he was, he had won the championship, but he, 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 he hadn't really, like, disassociated himself from everybody in the world at that point. And he was out in Pasadena, and my dad calls Bobby and says, hey, I'm over at Will Chamberlain's house. Will would really like you to come over. He wants to show you the house, you know, see you play. And, and Bobby said, oh, no, Dick, I can't do that. And my father said, why? Why can't you come over? He said, I'm not seeing people now. <laughs> and my dad was like, you're not seeing people? He's like, yeah, I'm not seeing people. Like, well, who are you seeing? What are you seeing? You know, and that, that was one of his favorites. He loved Wilt. Um, he was not as close with Kareem. Um, you know, Kareem was more standoffish. He was certainly, you know, um, more aloof with the media. Um, and over the years, I've had a few opportunities, you know, to try to do interviews with Kareem. And usually, you know, for whatever reason, he turned it down. But last year, he said yes. And we did an interview. Um, it might have been the day of or the day after Bill Russell died. And he was tremendous. And I interviewed Bill Bradley and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for a piece about Bill Russell. And that's one of uh, my favorite things we've done in the last few years. He was great. He was great. Is there an interview you never got or one you'd most like to do today? Today, you know, I don't know. That's a hard one, Dave. I mean, there are so many, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of the day-to-day -day interview. You know, and I, you saw, you know, I've, I interviewed Tom Brady a few months ago. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, Tiger Woods, just, you know, short interaction interviews, you know, at tournaments, that kind of thing. To me, you know, in some way, if, if you had to pick, you know, there's LeBron James, there's Tiger Woods, there's Tom Brady from the last, from the 21st century. Those are, you know, the figures that off the top of my head really stand out in some ways. Um, you know, if you were to sit down with them and really just say, it's all on the table. We'll talk about everything, right? That's more so the case with, not so much with LeBron. He's more of an open book. But, but with Woods and with Brady, those would be really interesting. One question you'd like to ask Brady or Woods. One question, that's all you get. How did the events of that night, Tiger, Thanksgiving 2009, change the trajectory of your career? You know, which I don't think anybody's ever had a chance to ask him. That'd be terrific. One of the people I think you've interviewed more than anyone in your career is Iron Mike Tyson. Yes. One of the great athletes of our time, one of the enigmas of the sports world. We have a great clip which will oh boy. live in infamy for all time. Okay. At what point did you think you couldn't win this fight? Oh, man, I don't know. He had me hurt from the beginning. He has kept me hurt all through the fight. Oh, oh, baby, be nice. And he was just fighting constantly. And I just, man, he was wonderful tonight. You know, he said quite often that Mike Tyson had never seen a fighter like Lennox Lewis before. Is that now something you can say that he was right about? Well, I don't know if I've never seen a fighter like that, but tonight he, he fought magnificently, and he was the best fighter tonight. Where do you go from here, Mike? I don't know, man. I might just fade into Bolivian, you know what I mean? Um, I don't have nowhere to go and nothing to do, you know what I mean? I just go fly my pigeons on the roof in New York, you know? <laughs> Though he was yeah. going to fade into Bolivian. Yeah, yeah. It was actually Malapop. nice symmetry, a, a peaceful Mike. Yeah. Of all your exchanges with him, what sticks with you? So I, a lot of them. I mean, if you know, it's um, you know, the guy that my father, I'm sure, interviewed the most in his career was Muhammad Ali. And the guy that I've interviewed by far the most in my career was Mike Tyson. And, and, and um, Mike's a very bright guy. 
Mike has a lot of demons. Mike is a very bright guy. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Like, like... That would be a surprise to a lot see, of people here tonight. And I'm I've sorry, interviewed really, him multiple I, times. I don't think people wouldn't perceive him that way. Oh, wow. You, you, Unintelligible in multiple interviews Oh, see, with I feel that Mike okay. is... Um, I've never interviewed anybody else who is... Um, as comfortable kind of plumbing the depths of their own psyche as Mike. Well and who is um, as attuned to, you know, what you're trying to achieve or what you're trying to get at. He's a very bright guy. Um, and we've talked about on many occasions um, his demons. And he's also a guy uh, we always have to remember who did terrible things. He is a convicted rapist. He went to prison for it. Um, Which we forgave, strange. I think, I think many people did. I think you're right. I think many people did. And I think he, it's, it's, it's amazing me, to me, to having you know, covered Mike in that era, you know, doing stories about you know, his time in prison. And then you turn on like late night TV and he's sitting there and you know, it's like a yuck fest. And I'm like, that's Mike Tyson. That's Michael Gerard Tyson, you know? And... Um, and yet, at the same time, he's the guy that I've certainly had, I think, the most memorable interactions with, um, the most, again, it's that effort to understand himself, which I think is really special. And, you know, we've had comedic moments together, kind of like that, but what he's saying in that moment, that's the moment in which, so that's after the Lennox Lewis fight in Memphis in 2002, and I, I, I tend to rhapsodize about this boxing stuff more than I should. Um, but, you know, that's the moment where basically it was over. You know, he, he'd come out of prison in 95. Everybody thought he was going to regain the heavyweight championship. He did it in some truncated form at some time. But this was the moment. And there were people who thought he was going to beat Lennox Lewis. I did not. And he got pummeled by Lennox Lewis. And that was the end of Mike as a serious contender. He fought three more times. He fought Clifford Etienne. He fought Kevin McBride. He fought Danny Williams. But it was over. And he knew it. And, you know, but when I think about Mike, um, that last fight in 2005, Kevin McBride, I was there in Washington. And uh, I remember it was a sad spectacle, as it so often is, at the end of a, a fighter's career. And I, I stood with him outside his dressing room right after the fight. I said, Mike, when did you know you were going to lose this fight? And he said, when I signed the contract. And, uh, and Kevin McBride was not a great fighter. Um, but... You know, there, there is a humanity in Mike. I interviewed him a few years ago about um, something that he had never been asked uh, in a TV interview before about being sexually abused when he was a kid, which he had alluded to, but it had kind of been under the radar. Nobody had ever followed up on it. So I asked him about that, and it was, um, it was he was, um, yeah, there's something about Mike. He's probably, he's one of the few athletes who's ever just called me out of the blue to talk. You know, to like say, hey, what's going on? How you doing? I thought it was a prank. And um, so there is, there is that, that um, humanity to him as well. A remarkable historical figure. Yes, sir. Your sports recall is incredible, by the way. It oh, is, thank you. It is off the charts. Um, I was originally going to ask you a question about Deion Sanders, uh, mm. but your, your buddy stole a little bit of the right. thunder, and I was going to have you separate the nil issue from Dion. But based on your answer, I'm changing my question. And I want to draw a parlay between how you respond between Nil and Dion to what's going on with Liv and the PGA Tour. Yeah, it's and get crazy, your, right? It's and a crazy get your story. thoughts on how people are talking about it, people in your profession, uh, how it's being dealt with in the political realm. It's, it's just curious to me. It's I would a love huge to... shock, you know. Yeah. It's a huge shock. <clears throat> and it's still, it's still very far from clear what's happening, you know, what's going to happen. You know, that initial press release, for those of you who aren't aware of what we're talking about, the Live Golf Tour, which was funded by um, the Saudis, you know, started up last year, and it drew away many of the top golfers in the world from the PGA Tour. So... They were banned from the PGA Tour, and there was all kinds of there were all kinds of statements from people like Rory McIlroy and from um, the head of the tour, basically saying, you know, these guys are dead to us. They're traitors. You know, they're aligning themselves um, 
with, with a regime that's responsible for uh, the death of, uh, you know, <laughs> a journalist who lived in America, Khashoggi, you know, a, you know, Phil Mickelson himself was the face of the live tour, you know, said to Alan Shipnuck, although he claimed it was off the record, I trust Alan on this, you know, he said, we know who we're dealing with, these are the guys who killed Khashoggi. Um, you know, all of that stuff, it's a fascinating story, but when they, when they you know, said it was going to be, you know, this truce then, and this, the, the word was merger, and then within hours they retracted that. So we're still trying to figure out the parameters of it, but what it amounts to basically is that, you know, the guy who runs uh, the, the investment fund for the kingdom is running golf, right? Um, it's, we've never seen anything like this. Now, you know, how it plays out is going to be very interesting. Was it a payoff? Was it a... They, it's bought, money. The, they yeah. bought the PGA Tour. That's exactly right. Just a quick follow-up. If When I think about nil and its impact on college sports, I'm in full agreement. I agree with your answer before. I take the same perspective on live in the PGA. A, a, a golfer has every right to maximize his payday. Right. Particularly those at the tail end of their career. To me, they're tantamount in the response. Um, that's, I'm just curious as to, Look, if you believe you know, in an open market, There are very few, and, right, you know, what, $200 million, $100 million, open market, you know, there are all kinds of, you know, justifications, and then there were guys who said no, right? So not everybody ran and took the money. And there are a lot of guys, I'm sure, who don't like this, don't want any part of it. And there are others who say, it's business, it's strictly business, and we can point to all kinds of arrangements between, you know, corporations and country, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is a fascinating time. You know, you look at, you know, um, sports washing, you know, a subject that we talk about a lot these days, uh, you know, on the serious side of sports, right? And what, what, you know, Saudi Arabia is trying to achieve, uh, what Qatar was trying to achieve, you know, by getting the World Cup. Um, by, you know, taking over Paris Saint-Germain. All of these things, it's, uh, it's a fascinating time. Would you, you take the much. money? Oh, God. Oh, I would. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, it depends how much you have. million dollars. Well, Tiger was offered more than that, and he said A billion, no, reported right? that, yes. Uh, we're about out of time. We will take one last question, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, I... So I four or five years ago at the Western Library and you hit it out of the ballpark like you're doing tonight. Thank you. And what I particularly enjoyed is what you mentioned a little bit earlier. Is you're talking about your father, Muhammad Ali, and you told a few stories. But is there one story that really sticks out in particular with their interactions? <sighs> there, okay, so yeah, uh, there are, you know, he had a million great Ali stories. He loved telling Ali stories. I'm trying to think, you know, he... he I'm trying to think what would be um, kind of the ultimate uh, Dick Schaap, Muhammad Ali story. <laughs> um, what, what was his favorite? I'm trying to think. Well, off the top of my head, there's one I was present for, you know, just as an observer, basically. But we were watching the, um, we were watching the second Tyson-Bruno fight. So somebody could look it up, but I think it's like 1994, 1995, and we were at uh, what was the All Star Cafe or something like that in Times Square. And it was uh, I was with my dad, and we were with Ali, and we're watching, um, you know, the undercard before Tyson and Bruno fight. Oh, it couldn't be 94, 95 because Tyson was in prison. So it had to be like 93, something like that. And um, and there are women on the undercard, women fighting on the undercard, which was pretty novel at the time. Now we're accustomed to it. You know, it's Olympic sport. You know, the champions are well known, like Clarissa Shields. But it was kind of a novelty at the time. People hadn't seen it. So my dad turns to Muhammad. And he says, Muhammad, what do you think of this? What do you think about women fighting? He didn't say anything for a second. And then he says, and he had a very soft, raspy voice by that point. He's like, I only like it when they're fighting over me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not knowing that Layla would become a world champion within about 10 years. Um, but that, you know, like, you know, it was just like, like that with him. And that was, that was one I got to see. Well, speaking of, women's sports are having their moment. What sparked it? 
you may go back to, to Billie Jean King, yeah. but it has happened Which in the last fifty years ago yesterday, years, right? Things dramatically changed. Well, look, it's all been a continuum um, in the last fifty years since the advent of Title IX, since 1972. Uh, you know, but it back... wasn't gradual; it was overnight. In the well, last I think it was one of those years. things. What is it? Is it? Is it? Is it Fitzgerald or is it Hemingway? Right? Like how you go broke like suddenly and then, or slowly and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden. And then all it? of a sudden. Which is it, Fitzgerald or Hemingway? I can't remember. Come on, Cornell. Which one? Come on. Let's go, Cornell. I think it's Fitzgerald. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we lived here in Westport. Um, I, I think it's, no, look, I mean, 99 was huge. I mean, you remember 99, sure. the Rose Bowl and all that. That has been the story of sports in the last half century, has been the rise of the female athlete and women's sports. Just as my father covered the rise of the African-American athlete from the 50s, shortly after Jackie Robinson broke the color line, of course, in 47 in the major leagues. Um, the rise of the African-American athlete was the story that he covered for all those decades. And what we've seen in the last 50 years has been the steady rise. And you're right, it is exponential. Um, you know, the ratings we're seeing in women's hoops are unbelievable and all the excitement in women's soccer and the professional leagues. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what, what's happened is, you know, these are the fruits of many decades of giving girls and then women access to sports that they didn't have. Did we not give them enough coverage? I, I'm a part of that. Well, I, I would say that ESPN, I mean, I'm very proud of what ESPN has done over the years. I mean, I- Leading I think, the way today, without question. Yeah, I question. think, you know, the amount of um, women's sports that are highlighted, we're always looking for more on ESPN. I think, yeah. I don't know the exact numbers, but I think, um, you know, <laughs> You know, I, I don't think it's a coincidence, right? You know, the, the rise of ESPN starting in 1979 and uh, the focus on the women's tournaments. Um, even what Gino was talking about a couple of weeks ago, the proximity of ESPN to stores. Um, that story, how important that was. Well, I, we're going to get you to Giants kickoff. But oh boy. you can obviously see and hear Jeremy's passion in his documentaries and his books and his speaking tonight and his writing. But for those of you that follow him on social media, and I hope you do, and if you don't, please check his Instagram feed out. His true Eat followers. His true passion is his meat. <laughs> yes, his meat. Too much. <laughs> All right, I like the barbecue. What do you want from me? Okay, you know. Well, I moved to the suburbs. <laughs> that brisket was dry. <laughs> that brisket was too dry. How were the ribs? But the fish always turns out great. The fish is good. And yet, the smoked fish, that's really my specialty. How are the ribs? People. You know, ribs are hard to screw up. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. I'm inordinately proud. <laughs> Yes. Our final Thank question, you. yeah. Is your final act as a Food Network host? I've been trying. I mean, my friend Peter Stern is here. He tried to sell a show. It didn't go anywhere. I, I, didn't, I didn't have the credibility. Um, but uh, if anybody's got any offers, I know a lot of people in town. There's probably, like, some Food Network, you know, executive in town. If you know him or her, let me, please. Does I'd he know to how to cook, it. Andy? Is it good? I mean, is I he a do good know how to master? Cook. Do I know how to cook? <laughs> no, that's true. It, it's it. I enjoy it. I enjoy. You it. do enjoy it. Please follow him on Instagram. <laughs> it's it's enjoyable. Uh, my thanks to all of you for being here tonight, and to Jeremy Schapp, the greatest sports reporter of our time, a part of our community. Thank you so much.